So it's great pleasure for me to give a talk for this workshop. Since the concept of this workshop is deeply intertwined with my fundamental research interest, this is namely how do the religious art and the architecture serve as a device for creating the feeling of solemnness, sacredness, and transcendency for the people entering or viewing them? And what is the mechanism of the religious monument to contextualize the existence of individual devotee into a certain narrative frame? So I have tried to find the answer to this question by focusing on the case study on the Buddhist rock monasteries in Kutia. So today I will present my observation on two different modes of meeting the Buddha that were created in Buddhist caves of Kutia by the cross reference of the archaeological future of the site, iconographical futures of the statues and wall paintings, as well as the textual sources. So I talk about Kutia. So Kutia was one of the most powerful oasis kingdoms in the eastern part of the historical Silk Road. So situated in northwest China, it played a crucial role for the traffic uh, between Central and East Asia. Kutia was a frontier of the East-West cultural encounter. A rich amount of Buddhist sites preserved in this region bears a witness to the great prosperity of Buddhism in Kutia Kingdom. <coughs> Here is a very brief overview of Buddhism in Kutia, just to give a context on, about what I'm talking about. So Buddhism had been already established in this region in the third century, as witnessed by both the rich amount of Sanskrit manuscripts dated to the second to the third century, imported from the Kushan Empire to this region, as well as a record about several Kutian monks engaged in the translation of Buddhist texts into Chinese in this period. Buddhism was a state religion in Kutia, and the monastic communities here received the royal patronage throughout its Buddhist period, as far as the historical records tell to us. So Kutia was a hub of the Sarvasti bodies, so one of the most powerful Buddhist schools in India and Central Asia. The Sarvasti bodies emphasized an importance in the Sanskritization of Buddhist texts. This is also reflected in Buddhist manuscripts excavated from Kutia. Most of them are in Sanskrit. In fact, Xuanzang, who visited Kutia in the early 7th century, reported that the local monks in Kutia could read Sanskrit well. In addition, texts were also written in their local languages. So a language, the Tokarian B, were also called Kutian in this region, showing the localization of the Sanskrit canonical texts. Even though Kutia is known as the homeland of Kumara Jiva, who was a Mahayanist, so Mahayana Buddhism only left traces in a few sites dated to the period of Tang's occupation of Kutia that were dated to the middle of the 7th century to the 8th century. <clears throat> so its material trace is very limited. Seen from all perspectives, so the historical record, excavated manuscripts, and the content of the iconography of an art object, the majority of Kutian Buddhist sites can be safely attributed to the Salvastivada tradition. So there must have been numerous freestanding so structural monasteries within the kingdom, as reported by some Chinese monks, but those structural monasteries were heavily damaged in the course of over a thousand years uh, since the monastery were abandoned. So in contrast, the rock cut monasteries preserve their interior and decoration much better. So we can use these cave temples as the most variable primary source to learn about Kutia and Salvastivada Buddhist culture. But one thing has to be always kept in mind if one studies any Buddhist cave site in general. So the present cave site are the final form after over centuries of modification. So the situation is comparable to the old town areas in modern city. So we may see an old church in the middle of the city. Uh, so in the Gothic style, standing next to the modern shopping centers, so such as 
Asian there, more car stuff. <laughs> so, and it is, of course, impossible to describe the nature of this city uh, <coughs> by referring uh, these older and newer buildings without considering their different dates, so, so different datings. So the similar situation happened at cave sites. Since the newer and older caves are now standing next to each other, and the modern reconstruction of the stairway for tourists creates a misleading impression, as if they, these older and newer caves belong and uh, function together and were used in the same period. So it's yeah, just a uh, yeah, misleading impression. So we have to be aware of the fact that the original connection of the caves belonging to one particular phase were often very different from what we see now at the site. This is partly owing to the loss of the most of the antechamber of the caves. So the archaeological traces and the historical records inform us that the Kucha caves, both decorated and undecorated, originally consisted of the antechamber and the main chamber, but nowadays only the main chamber have survived, while the most of antechamber have been lost due to the collapse of the cliff side. So it may be comparable to the Christian church, which only preserves its apps, uh, while all other sections are lost. But in fact, some historical record uh, bears witness to the decoration of the antechamber. So the iconographical program of the main chamber was once completed by those in the antechamber. Another crucial element, which is now absent in the caves, is the main devotional statues. Either sculpted as a clay or wooden statue, most of them are lost now. So we have to think of the fact that the primary images in the cave temples are mostly lacking. Even the wall paintings that are better preserved than the statues in general, lost their most outstanding colors, so namely gold, silver, and tin buildings. So as you can see, the painting fragment seen on this slide uh, contains a lot of the scratched sections. So especially where the nimbus and mandola of bodhisattva figures are depicted. These were the sections where the metallic gilding was applied but later stripped uh, due to their financial value. So by taking all these lost factors into consideration, we tried a virtual reconstruction of the caves in its original conditions uh, through the typological analysis of the present remain. With the help of the excavation reports by early expeditions at the beginning of the 20th century, in collaboration with the archaeologist, Professor Giuseppe Vignato in, of Peking University. So the result of our collaborative research over 10 years has been just published as a book, The Traces of the Sadhubhasti Bodies in the Buddhist Monasteries of Kucha, as the third publication of the Kucha Studies series. So my talk today is extracted from the main argument we made in this book. So based on the typological study, we classified Sadhubhasti Bada caves in Kucha into four pages and named two main pages among them tentatively as Tradition A and Tradition B. So Tradition A is characterized by the cave group consisting of the square caves and monastic cell with a simple structure. So the square caves are decorated with the wall paintings in the first Indo-Iranian style, with a narrative tradition uh, closely related to early Sanskrit literature from the Kushan period. The tradition B, in contrast, typically consists of the cave group of more than one central, central pillar caves and monastic cells that are furnished with stone beds and straight space. So the different designs of the living space for the monastics in tradition A and B caves may indicate different Vinaya rules concerning their monastic life. The central pillar caves were painted in the second Indo-Iranian style with a narrative representation that seems to be closely related to the stories compiled in the Mura Sadhubhastipada Vinaya. As a cross reference of the studied results from the archaeological 
iconographical, philological, and preservation scientific approaches, he concluded that tradition A is the early subversive and monastic culture of Kuja that was associated with the system Ryu, which is generally translated as subversive and Vinaya, <coughs> likely flourished around the fifth to the middle of the sixth century, while tradition B, as a later subversive and monastic culture of Kuja, closely associated with the Mura subversive and Vinaya, likely flourished around the middle of the sixth to the seventh century. So our study suggests that there existed at least two different subgroups of the Shadubastivada monastic communities in Kuja, one developed a little earlier and another a little later. And it is these two traditions that had different models of the space making form eating the Buddha as seen in their cave temples. <clears throat> so first, uh, let's focus on the installation of the Buddha images in the early tradition, so earlier tradition. So tradition A cave group has two typical uh, types of decorated square caves. One is those with a central Buddha statue and another one with a large figure field. The first type, so the cave with a central Buddha image, are found not only in the cave site. So a similar structure can also be found in the structural monasteries belonging to this period. So the function of this cave type can only be fully understood by considering its antechamber. The antechamber is spacious enough to host a large assembly of worshippers, and the painting decorating the antechamber is quite large, so with figures larger than the life size. Remarkably, there is always a right in the floor level uh, so between the antechamber and the main chamber, indicating the different levels of sacredness of these two rooms. The main chamber is, in contrast, smaller than the antechamber and it's dark and narrow due to the large Buddha statue so occupying the middle section of this uh, main chamber. So this Buddha statue is installed on the stone pedestal it, and it's larger than the uh, entrance door of this main chamber. So it is apparently intended as an unmovable permanent installation. The detailed narrative and figurative paintings that cover all the walls of the main chamber are certainly very visible in this dark and narrow space. So this darkness and narrowness of the main chamber is apparently a deliberate choice by the stone masons, since uh, there is another type of tradition A caves with a large figured field, the main chamber of which is designed to be very bright to, uh, to be lit <clears throat> by one or two uh, windows, so inviting the enough sunlight to so shed its interior. The size of the paintings is also around three by four meter large, and the main figures are depicted larger than the life size. So the good visibility of the painting was the main concern of this cave type. Interestingly, the wall paintings of these caves only focus on the Abadana stories about kings or merchants, and the Buddha image never depicted in this type of bright interior space. So let's have a close observation of the caves with Buddha statues. The main statue of the seated Buddha image is around two, uh, two half meter tall, which corresponds to the Jan Liu tall, so which is a canonized body size of the Buddha in Buddhist literature, including the Salvasivada Vinaya Vibhasa. So it means that the Buddha statue installed in the main chamber is intended to be a real size Buddha, so to say. So, if considering this future, the paintings of the main chamber makes more sense as the narrative scenes painted in this type of caves mostly illustrate what the Buddha did in his previous and last verses. So furthermore, the Gandalva musicians playing the music on the celestial balcony is also a typical motif seen in the paintings of main chamber. Both the architect and architectural and iconographical features of this cave type suggest that these caves were intended as a Gandakuti, so the perfumed chamber. 
So this is a term often referred in the Vinayas and narrative literatures, as well as inscriptions in Buddhist cave sites in India. It stands for the permanent residence of the Buddha to be built in the middle of the monastic cells. So Gandakti has been identified in various Buddhist monasteries in India and Gandhara that are typically equipped with a central Buddha statue. So this Buddha image was regarded as a substitute of the actual Buddha, who was regarded as symbolically of us who are spiritually present in this chamber and played a role as the owner of the monastery in a legal sense, so that he can be a recipient of the offerings provided for the monastic community. And the essential feature of the Gandhakti is that it had a pleasant fragrance. As John Strong and Gregory Chopin emphasized, a scent of a fresh flower and perfumes served as a mediation to summon the spiritual presence of the Buddha. In this regard, it is worth paying attention that in tradition A caves in Kucha, the motifs related to the scent can be observed, such as the scent eater. Gandalubas depicted on the four walls surrounding the Buddha statue. The narrative paintings of the main chamber of Kizil Cave 149a are striking as well, uh, since it illustrates the Puduna Avadana, so telling about the establishment of the first Gandakuti by the Buddha's disciple Puduna, who built the Gandakuti by the valuable sandalwood uh, with a um, so wonderful shape. So based on these observations, I would suggest regarding these caves as a tradition A Buddha hall, where the local Buddhist people could stay in the antechamber, maybe offer some fresh flowers or perfumes on the ritual furniture, and could meet the real Buddha, who solemnly appeared in the dim light of the richly decorated main chamber. The installation of the Buddha image in the later Sadhvasivada tradition in Kucha, on the other hand, was drastically different. The decorated worship space of the tradition B cave group was typically the central pillar caves, which share more or less the similar iconographical program as shown on this slide. Among various subjects represented in this type of caves, the two narrative uh, representations the Mahapani Urbana and the Indra Shaila Guha include the Buddha statue at the center of the compositions and thus can be regarded as two devotional forces of tradition B caves. The innermost section of the central pillar caves was fully dedicated to represent the episodes concerning the Buddha's Mahapani Urbana and the rare walls of the rare corridor was occupied by the Mahapani Nirvana Buddha image, either painted or carved as a large statue. So the latest reference to the comprehensive, comprehensive study on the Pali Nirvana representations in Kucha was recently published by my teacher, Professor Monika Jin. This is a very new phenomenon in the context of the Sarvastivada Buddhist culture in Kucha, because in tradition eight caves, it's put greater emphasis on the Buddha's historical, rather mystical presence in their cave temples. The Buddha's Mahapanirvana was very emphasized in their decor. So, a new topic of the painting, which was never seen in tradition A caves, is a post Palinirvana story, such as a first council. The repeated depiction of this subject may suggest that for the monastic community of tradition B, the Buddha is rather a historical person, and the emphasis may have been put on the fact that the Buddha's teaching and the Vinaya lineage of the monastic community was properly transmitted and inherited in Kucha. The different tendency of tradition A and tradition B monastic cultures can also be observed by paying attention to the difference of the preferred narrative topics of the paintings. So in tradition A caves, the narrative paintings illustrate various stories focusing on the rich and powerful laymen, such as kings and merchants in the mystical past. 
자또 A 자베이스온자 R 이상스크리트나디그리탈자사자구자샤리가카르파나만디피카안소옹아동구위자아가마소부자사르바스티바디스 and while in tradition B the stories related to the actual Vinaya rules were preferred with the protagonist who are not only rich people but represent all of the social strata. So the majority of the so far identified stories represented in the painting in tradition B caves to, uh, <coughs> can be related to the Muda Sarupa Sivada Vinaya. So actually, I would love to listen to the opinion of Dr. Henry Alberi on this point after hearing his fantastic talk yesterday. So just to my eyes, the Buddha images in these two traditions appear like this. So the tradition A emphasizes the Buddha as a mystical and rather a historical figure, while tradition B, so the Buddha is regarded as a historical person who has already passed away, but his teaching continues until today. Another interesting installation of a Buddha statue in tradition B central pillar cave can be found in the rear wall of the main chamber, which is in most cases dedicated to representing the Indra Guha motif. So that is a story about the Buddha meditating in the mountain cave while the god Indra and his Gandalva attendant Panchashka visited the cave to awake the Buddha sentry and asked for giving a sermon. Even though the main Buddha statue in the niche is now all lost, the stucco decoration of the mountain pattern surrounding the niche, as well as the paintings showing Indra and Kalchashka visiting, visiting the Buddha in the mountain, assure the subject of this wall as Indra's visit. To the question why this story served as a main image of Central Pita Caves in Buddha, many scholars have suggested that this story provides a prototype of a Buddhist sanctuary in mountain caves where the monks can meditate. And some scholars also associated these caves with the actual mountain cave affiliated with the site of Indra's visit in India. So according to Xuanzang, who visited this cave located near Nalanda. So statues were installed in this cave to imitate the ancient sacred ritual. So this account indeed provides a good reason why people set the Buddha image in the caves with a representation of the Indra's visit story to create a replica cave space where this sacred event happened. Uh, more interesting information is attained in the Muda Sarvasti Vada Vinaya Kushutra Kabastu, which describes a large annual festival celebrating the interest visit to be held in the mountainside, which provided an opportunity for laymen uh, to <clears throat> visit the mountain caves. So if laymen indeed visited the mountain caves for such occasions, they might uh, have needed a clear object to worship. So thus, there are many good reasons to install the Buddha image in the cave temples representing this story. And interestingly, the Buddha images installed in the niche of Central Pillar Caves was most likely carved from wood and was likely movable, as the archaeological traces indicate. Indeed, a wooden mandala which fit the size of the niche of Central Pillar Cave was an earth from Kijil Caves so making this hypothesis plausible. This leads to the assumption that the small wooden statues of the seated Buddha figures and also Kizil could have been the miniature version of the main niche of the central pillar caves. So we can obtain more or less the imagination how the lost Buddha images in the main niche of the central pillar caves. This observation that the main Buddha image installed in the main central pillar, the main niche of the central pillar caves was portable one, may have to be considered together with Xuanzang's record on the popularity of the image procession of Buddha. So he reported that at the venue of the Queen, uh, Queen, Queen, Queen Nair assembly held outside the Western gate of the capital, a large number of the Buddha images 
decorated with precious jewels and valuable silk textiles were carried on the procession wagons. Then he wondered, so from where these portable statues are carried to the festive venue? So the center of Hidake, the most popular and numerous scape type in Kucha, might have provided to the place to keep his portable Buddha statue at the ordinary times. So here we, I conclude my presentation. So the shift of the Sarvasti Bada Buddhist culture in Kucha from tradition A to B was accompanied by the shift of the emphasis and function of the Buddha statues installed in the caves. So in tradition A, it was intended as a mediation to summon the spiritual presence of the Buddha, while in tradition B, it was rather a symbolic aid to worship the Buddha as a historical person, while the main statue set in the niche could have served as a, uh, so could have served for an image ritual procession. Yeah, thank you very much to your attention and I would be very grateful with your critical feedback. Thank you very much.